Get up, get ready, get your coffee and your cup because we have another at home edition of World of Fortnite. I'm your host, Sarah Piggy Face Lynn, and with me, as always, still virtually, is Shia Wager. Always virtually, you know how it goes. We have a great show for you today. We're looking at the weird weapons in the rotation. One of interest takes an aim at the Ice King, and of course, we have everything the community is passing around in the low ground. Before we move on, Shia, I want to get your opinion on something. Season 5 is coming to an end, so what do you want to see happen in Season 6? I want two Fortnite maps on the island at the same time. I, I just want some crazy stuff. I want even more than what they're giving me. I know it's impossible, but a man can dream. Well, we're going to have to see if Shio uh, dreams become memes or if they become true. But up next, the rotation runs down the top five weirdest weapons in Save the World. <gasps> Fortnite Save the World might not be the greatest in terms of mission objectives or the storyline, but it surely has a pretty interesting loop pool. PvE games don't usually need a lot of balance, and developers can keep pushing the boundaries of what players can do in-game. Some of the most fun Fortnite weapons are, in fact, in Save the World, and not in Battle Royale. However, variety always comes with its ups and downs, and this is no exception. Today we'll be taking you through five of the weirdest weapons in Fortnite Save the World. At number five, we have the Tiny Instrument of Death, a ranged pistol that launches miniature rockets that you can control. As a concept, this is one of the most interesting weapons in Fortnite, but it's just as annoying to use and lacks an important feature. The idea of the gun is that once you shoot a projectile, you can control where that projectile goes. Unlike the guided missile from Battle Royale, you aren't given a POV from the projectile, and that's where the weapon falls short. The problem is, it's hard to hit your shots with it. After you shoot it, there's no way to tell how far the projectile has traveled. Moreover, the fiery trail it leaves behind makes it even harder for you to tell how far it has traveled if you shot it in a straight line. Because you only have to rely on how much time has passed after shooting it, it is so hard to hit your shots as intended. The rockets do a decent amount of damage, and the pistol could be a great weapon if Epic fixed this issue. Number four on our list is the Storm King's Fury, the creepiest melee weapon in the game. This one is a mythic weapon that is amazing in terms of usability. Hitting enemies builds up your stacks and using your special attack brings down a powerful meteor shower, depending on how many stacks you have. In this one, the weapon is pretty much an attachment of a dead hand at the end of a stick. The purple hand is lifeless and rigid, and every time you use your special attack, you beat it hard to the floor. The hardware weapon can be obtained as a random drop after eliminating the giant Storm King. The Protagonist of Save the World. The mythic weapons obtained this way are all modeled after the Storm King, but they are at least modified to suit the weapon style. At number three, we have the Paper Shredder. The Paper Shredder is a ranged pistol with a slow fire rate and an even slower projectile speed. An interesting part about it is that the projectile is a paper plane. The weird part about this gun is that it rarely hits where you're aiming, and this isn't a bug. The plane almost always goes in a different direction that makes no real sense, and I'm not sure what the thought process was behind this weapon. In itself, the Paper Plane projectile is a pretty good idea, but the execution is just very strange. The weapon uses shotgun shells, but it's pretty much an explosive weapon that has a small radius of explosion and rarely sees any play in the game. It's somewhat similar to the tiny instrument of death, except that it's the opposite end when it comes to aiming the gun. You just can't control it. This could be a great version of the guided missile where you can become the plane and control it where it goes. Number two on our list is the Master's Driver, a golf club. This weapon is just an average melee weapon that does just fine with Snare as the sixth perk and a decent hero loadout. It is outclassed by many others that are just as easy to obtain and rarely ever sees any play, but its mediocrity isn't what makes it strange. Now here's the thing, this game already has strange weapons like detached hands and guns powered by paper planes. This one just hits differently, literally. Its basic attack is just a horizontal swing, but the special attack is a full on golf swing. I don't know what the thought process behind this one was either but the developers were probably cracking up when animating this one it's fun to use if you can look past the damage and hitting zombies with a golf club like that never gets old at number one we have the makeshift sword every kid has tried to use at least once we're talking about the ruler sword a sword that is literally the ruler you used to use to draw lines in school it's strange that while you're already a commander at the beginning of the game 
and have a pistol and an assault rifle a basic ruler is your first melee weapon the sword ruler cannot be modified leveled up or even upgraded it does low damage it's less useful as you progress throughout the game and the husks don't even seem to care if you hit them with it you also can't delete it from your inventory it just stays at the bottom with the other great weapons Note to self, if there's ever a zombie apocalypse in the future, look for something sharp in your kitchen and not in your school bag. Chayo, if you were going to design a weird weapon to use in the Battle Royale mode, what would it be? Uh, for me, I already got this locked on. It's a portable player launcher, PPS for short. Basically, you could just throw your squad mates, you know, into enemy builds or across the map for sick rotations. It'd be nice but maybe hard to code depending on the game. Uh, Sarah, what about you? You know, is it a weapon you want to design or is it something in the rotation that caught your eye? What would you want in the game? I mean, there's already a weapon in the rotation that I kind of want to talk about. It's the sword that looks like a ruler. You could say it is one sword to ruler them all. But on that note, we have Bravo. to move on because we have an important guest stopping by to chat all about all things Fortnite. Today, we're joined again by my good friend Clay, uh, helping us break down everything that's happening in Comp Fortnite right now. Clay, thank you so much for coming back to chat with me. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be back. It's so nice to have you. Now, we did speak back in December regarding the then current state of Comp Fortnite. You've had a few months to kind of see how the trio's format has had an impact on both the players and the game itself. Do you still hold the same opinion that trios is the way to go? I do. I really do, especially because we got that announcement that we're going to have it for the entire year. There's been so many improvements to the format. They're, they're changing it in between rounds as well. So overall, I've been really, really happy with the way competitive Fortnite has gone this season and where it's going to go soon. Yeah, we're going to have to see what happens next season. I know Epic has been infamous for shaking things up season season, but they're in a really good groove right now. So you've been working a lot on NA West, though, during FNCS have to ask has there been a team that has really stood out to you or a team that surprised you in any way yeah definitely they were the winners of heat four in the semifinals ruben buzzo and or Debs. they have kind of come in and just been dominating they did end up winning only by two points but overall they got two victory royales and they were back to back so i'm really really excited to see how they play in a set lobby format because they haven't really gotten the chance to do so other than heats. And we know heats sometimes are not as stacked as finals as they should be. Finals should be the stack of the stack. And so I'm excited to see how they perform. I am definitely excited as well. You kind of took the words out of my mouth though for the next question. The semifinals, like you said, did just wrap up this past weekend. And next weekend, we're actually going to be moving into the finals. So the top three teams, like you said, they finished super close in terms of points, within five points of one another. Do you have any predictions going into the finals or is it still just too close to call for you right now? Well, I'd say there's really four or five big teams right now of NA West, Arkham's trio, Reach trio, um, Wavy Jacob's trio, Symmetrical's trio. And then I would even go to either or Depp's trio or Falconer's trio. So with Arkham's trio, they're really, really good. But if they don't get off to a good start, I they have to play the catch-up game. And they're really great at that. So I don't know how it's going to work with set lobbies. But in all honesty, Symmetrical has been surprising me week to week to week. He has constantly been getting good games early. And with Symmetrical, that is so key. If he has a bad game early, it is really hard for him to come back. But every single week, he's come out back to back with really, really great games. And that's why he's been dominating so much. So I'm definitely keeping my eyes on him. Yeah, I, I could not agree with you more. And you, you did touch a little bit earlier on the fact that Ruben's uh, trio, who came in first place in the semifinals, they actually clutched two wins up with 147 points. But then you take a look at NorCal Kenji, uh, Kenji uh, Snacky, and Pure Chris, and they didn't win at all. They didn't have any victory royales, uh, but their average placement was higher. So, you know, leaning into more of like a placement style uh, FNCS, do you do you think that you 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 like that? Do you think that placement over eliminations and victory royales kind of matters more to show consistency across teams? I think a good balance of eliminations and victory royales and placement is great. The one that we have now, once you get to top three, you see a significant bump in points. And just quickly looking at Kenshi Snacky and Chris's performance, they got three overall top three. So they got a third place, a third place, and a second place in their games. 
So that's a lot, a lot of consistent points there for them. And they never once placed outside of the initial placement points in their game. So very, very great game stare from them. And they also racked up a lot of eliminations. So overall, their, their roundabout game is really, really great to see, especially to see how it does in the current point format, especially going into finals. Let's move away from Comp Fortnite for just one second. I gotta ask, the island is going a little bit haywire. What the heck is going on with the zero point? Do you have any predictions on where Epic plans to take the story and lore of the island next? I honestly don't, but luckily for us, Epic actually just like put out a little blog post, a little teaser, and they were like, when season five concludes, you're gonna be able to hop in and play this, I think it's called the Zero Crisis Finale. And so they said it's gonna be explosive. It's gonna change reality as we know it. I don't know, but I am so excited. If it's anything like that Galactus event, I'm really, really looking forward to it. One more question. You know, we touched on this a little bit earlier, saying that competitive Fortnite is, is in arguably one of the best states that it's been in in a very long time. What though would you like to change if anything? And for next season, what do you think something um, is that should stay the same? Ooh, that is a great question. Obviously we know format and when it compares to game mode is gonna be the same. They announced all 2021 is going to be trios. So if anything, I would like to see an improvement to the auto qualification process. I like it the way it is now, but I definitely think that um, having so many teams come in through, semi, uh, through series points, sometimes hinders the way heats are played just a little bit. So maybe an improvement there. Play, that is all the time we have today. So thank you so, so much again for joining me and letting me pick your brain on all things Fortnite. Seven, six, five, five. Right. Right. That's it. Right. Give it back to the Nice. Give a mini. Yeah, Give me that hunting. I'm messing shit up with that. Here? I'm getting, I'm getting a trap wall. Dead, dead, dead! Free fire? Okay, when he reses, I'm gonna break the wall. Push, push. Okay, Jesse, look. Oh my god! Bro! As always, Hot Drops brought the heat, but we gotta bring it down to ground level. So let's check out Low Ground. First up, Bra Moment 1258 says, you get what you deserve, buddy.
Never forget, kids, karma will eventually get you. Sometimes it gets you right in the head, a little bit of a headache, and sends you back to the lobby. You could say that he wasn't ahead of the game on that one. Not at all. Speaking of, Multi Blue Gamer provides us with this little bit of karma. There's just something so satisfying about watching the player that killed you get killed. I mean, honestly, it's almost like revenge, but you're living vicariously through someone else, I guess. But moving on, JTN Eagle created a music video for the Butter Barn Hoedown. I don't know about anybody else, but I suddenly have this great urge to eat a stack of man cakes. I mean, pancakes. Okay, man cakes or pancakes or cookies or bread or waffles. And now I'm getting carried away. So let's move on quick. Next, the Dusky x -Lops showing us that the zero point will distort the sound of your emotes. Zero point looks like it's about ripe to explode. Listen, I don't know what's been going on with this zero point lately, but every time I run past it, it makes this little noise. It scares me. I don't need any more jump scares in the game. So hopefully at the end of this season, we finally get the conclusion with the zero point that we've all been looking for. But finally, Cypher K congratulated Laserbeam on Twitter for receiving a skin in game. He wrote, Hey, Laserbeam, congrats on the Fortnite Icon series skin. Excited to watch the reveal. But then he added the angry crying face behind a happy mask meme. So I don't know how genuine that congratulation really was. Hey, listen, you know, Cypher is an OG of the Fortnite scene and he's been putting in work the past few years. So I understand, you know, I feel like his time is coming, though, that icon skin is right around the corner. I couldn't agree with you more. I like that he's having a little bit of fun with Laser Beam. You know, Laser Beam shows that he can certainly dish it out, but he, he can take it as well. So it's <laughs> nice to see these two having some fun. Yeah, absolutely. Up next, we have the story of the Ice King in Point of Interest. Fortnite Chapter 1 will always be the most memorable period of the game. The game was new, the guns were new, and we were experiencing characters and a storyline in a battle royale game for the first time. One of the most popular characters of the Chapter 1 story is the Ice King, a character that changed the map forever and kickstarted the events that would eventually lead to the end of the Chapter 1 island. Today, we'll be taking you through the story of the Ice King and why he is such an important character in Fortnite. The Ice King was introduced as a Tier 100 Battle Pass skin in Chapter 1 Season 7, and this was Fortnite first Christmas season after the game exploded in popularity. As for the character, we didn't know what his purpose of coming to the island was quite yet, as Fortnite's plot hadn't given us the bigger picture. The Ice King came in four different variants and had a female counterpart called the Ice Queen, but her role in the story was never really clarified. As a nice little touch, both of them also have voices in Save the World. Season 7 was all about an invasion on the Fortnite island where a number of characters came to our map on a giant mobile iceberg. This invasion was led by Sergeant Winter, who worked under the Ice King and controlled a bunch of evil snowmen who could pilot planes. The iceberg also brought with it the Ice King's very own castle called Polar Peaks. This was introduced as a new point of interest on the map and was located near Greasy Grove. The Ice King didn't do much in his own season. First, he introduced his signature weapon called the Infinity Blade that was pretty broken and caused a huge shift in the regular and Team Rumble meta for a while. If you had this weapon, you were probably winning the game. 
Polar Peaks also brought in a bunch of eggs that hatched into hybrid, a human and dragon hybrid in season eight. Although the skin wasn't that great, the Game of Thrones crossover theories that came up before the eggs hatched were pure gold. Soon, the Ice King stirred up the biggest ice storm the island had ever seen. Every inch of the map was covered in snow after the Ice King's live event, and I must say, the guy has some pretty cool moves. This event also gave us the ice zombies that were similar to the cube zombies from season six. The question remained, why would a character so powerful invade the Fortnite island? What did he want? And why was it so important for him to rule over our map? While the Ice King's invasion gave us a bunch of good content updates, his most important contribution to the story was hidden under polar peaks. A giant one-eyed monster was living under polar peaks waiting for the ice to melt. This monster, called the Devourer and later released as a skin, showed us in Season 9 what the Ice King really wanted from our island. The island got warmer in Season 8, and we had a pirate coming to the island in search of something. The Ice King was on the island at this point, and he now had competition. Assuming that the pirate was after the same thing he was looking for, he followed suit. In the Season 8 live event, the volcano at the north end of the island exploded, and some of the lava hit polar peaks further accelerating its melting speed. The Ice King's master plan finally came into action in season nine, when the Devourer rose from polar peaks and went straight for the Loot Lake Vault. The Devourer was apparently trying to extract the Zero Point from it. The Zero Point is a blue orb that is the source of the Fortnite Island's energy, and that was what the pirates and the Ice King were looking for all this time. At this point, a character called Singularity was ready to battle it out with her giant metal robot. This was one of the best live events Fortnite has ever had, and it ended with Singularity defeating the Ice King's monster. Ironically, she needed the power of the Zero Point to defeat the Devourer. This left the Zero Point vulnerable and unstable, which led to the time-altering events of Season X and the ultimate demise of the Chapter 1 map. If the Ice King had never tried to mess with the Zero Point, we would likely still be on that island. The Black Hole would never exist, battle between Ghost and Shadow would never have happened, Galactus would never arrive on the island, and Midas would never get the opportunity to mess with the storm. Not cool, Ice King. Not cool. Shio, looking back, what were your favorite moments surrounding the Ice King era of Fortnite? Uh, for me, it was just watching the first iteration of Planes, looking at Polar Peak coming in, the big monster versus robot fight. There was so much, I'm not sure if you would agree, but it was a very nice time for Fortnite. Uh, for me, it, it was okay. You know, the sword kind of uh, was, a, was a blip on there for myself, and I'm sure a lot of people share that sentiment. But that about does it for us. But for more of our content, check out our YouTube and Twitter channels at Squad State. Thank you so much for watching. And now here is your final Victory Royale with cheese.